So we've been discussing a research future for French Polynesia and in, indeed for the, for the planet. You guys are all coming from New York, so we're in a uh, globalized world and how do we develop sustainably. So that's kind of the theme of this talk, but I'm just going to give you a little uh, introduction to the Gump Station and uh, research on Moraire. So, but first of all, I want to start off with a, a view of the world. I was playing with Google Earth uh, one day and just looking at, at, at us here in Tahiti, and, and this is the view from this side of the planet. And so it, it, it was one of the, and I just discovered that myself, and it shocked me when I saw it, and now I use it a lot in presentations. And of course, anyone can see this, but it's, uh, and we know that we're, we're at the heart of the Pacific Ocean, but until I saw this, this visualization of it, it, it hadn't hit me just how much ocean there is on the planet and how much of it is all around us. Because we are uh, here in the center of the Pacific on, on Moraire, uh, more specifically obviously in French Polynesia, which is a vast uh, area of real estate, 5,000 or uh, 5 million square kilometers. So a huge chunk of the globe, a bit, bit of the planet that's certainly visible from space. And as I say, in, in the heart of this uh, massive ocean. Uh, more specifically, uh, so on the island, in terms of our research and scientific capacity, it's a pretty unusual, unusual place in that we have two international research stations on the same island, uh, collaborating with uh, French Polynesia. We have obviously the Berkeley University of California, Berkeley, so uh, the Gump Station, and uh, the French lab Creob, uh, run by CNRS Apache, on the other side of Rotui here. So the Creob has been here since 1971. Uh, studying primarily coral reefs. So that makes the Moraes coral reefs one of the longest and best studied uh, in the world. The continuous uh, station studying them since 1971. Uh, the Gump Station was established in 1985, so a little more recent, uh, and is owned and operated by the University of California, specifically by the Berkeley campus. So I'm, I'm a Berkeley employee. And, and we have various partners, um, of course one that you know very well, uh, the collaboration with Te Pua the, the association, non-profit organization, uh, running the cultural center uh, on, the prop on the same property here next door. And of course, uh, a growing collaboration with the Ross School. So we, we have this uh, combined uh, initiative with the French lab and, and ourselves, which we call the Moray Eco Station, which is under uh, the coordination of the government of French Polynesia, the research department. To really to understand and try and study more air as a whole system. We also have a newish partnership with a, a facility that's being developed on Tetiroa that you uh, have helped <laughs> inaugurate over there uh, last week. So it's, as you saw, it's a, it's a new research lab and a, a, a private island, a small island, but uh, one we can study and, and compare to Morea, which will be uh, some very rich uh, comparisons. And again, the Ross School has been in on the ground floor of, of the Tetiroa Eco Station. So what's interesting with these uh, situations here is we have you know, Tetiroa, a very small, private island, uh, it's obviously a very small population. Uh, Morea, a level of complexity greater, public island, so yeah, all the complexity that comes with having a, a, a public institutions and population, 17,000 people, see quite a bit bigger, and a big island in the middle of the lagoon with all the things that flow off the main island into the lagoon and affect it, which Tetura obviously doesn't have as an atoll. And then we can go up another scale to a, an even more complex and large system, uh, Tahiti itself, with 180,000 people and a, big, and a major urban uh, area. So for, for science, we've got these levels of complexity in social ecological systems that we can compare and contrast and ratchet up from a relatively simple system up to uh, a very complex one. <clears throat> also within that framework of, of you know, uh, natural experiment, natural laboratory for, for research here, uh, the islands, you know, the Society Islands, the archipelago, has a, a range of uh, island ages. So Tahiti is the newest, youngest island, and as we come out to Bora Bora, the islands get progressively older. So we can compare islands as they age. So this is Morea today. If we want to know what Morea will look like in three million years' time, we can go to Bora Bora, and that's kind of what Morea might look like then, but we can do it now. We have our time ship. Right? That's, that's the beauty of these hot spot archipelagos. The Hawaiian Islands, of course, are somewhat similar. And if you look even further into the future, you know, Morea will become an atoll. But there are atolls we can go and look at today. 
So just looking at this atoll, if we want to ask the question, what would Morea's lagoon be like if we took away the island out of the middle of it and all the impacts that come from that island? Well, we can go somewhere like that and look. How, how is it different when you take away all of the runoff and everything else that comes from a big island? So that's a pretty cool experiment. It'd be pretty hard to do uh, yourself. Take away the island of Morea would be difficult. Um, <coughs> also, in, in terms of our context, we're in this very interesting uh, social situation, which is, I think, indicative around the, uh, of situations around the world. But here, the various phases are very well demarked. We, we know when these transitions hurt. These are major transitions that human society has been through everywhere. But here, they're very clear, very stark. So these islands arose in the middle of the ocean, bare. They had to be colonized by plants and animals. And so they gradually built up a, a natural ecosystem. And that was most of their history. And then there was a very shocking event that happened, which was the arrival of the first uh, humans. So apart from the birds, the first vertebrates, mammals, um, arrived on these islands in canoes and completely destabilized the system. They brought a lot of other species with them, of course, and changed, modified the habitats a lot. And those, uh, uh, what that reflected really was a, a, an increase in the connectivity of Morea, and, and the same applies to other Polynesian islands, to the rest of the world. Now they were connected by canoes, which were capable of carrying a lot more things, whereas previously it was just birds and whatever blew in on the winds. So there's an increase in connectivity of the system, and the system was un completely unraveled and, and reconstituted itself as a social ecological system this time, not just natural, but natural plus human. And that achieved a certain balance in Polynesian uh, times until, again, another very destabilizing event occurred, and that we know almost to the day, or we do know to the day, when Europeans arrived in another form of uh, uh, transport technology, sailing ships, which was increased the connectivity of Morea yet more. So now, now uh, with, after European colonization, there's massive influx again of new ideas, new species, and another complete uh, transformation of the system was one of the most striking being the introduction of diseases, which literally wiped out most of the population. So there's a huge uh, consequence of this increase in connectivity. And then after, after European arrival, there was a period of adjustment. And up until probably about the time of the Second World War, there was a period of stability, which was, again, another huge transition was when, uh, during the Second World War, we TD really became connected to the modern world. Uh, airports were built, uh, and particularly with nuclear testing in the 60s, a massive influx of people, uh, money, and you know, the beginning of globalization and the connect connection of Tahiti to the rest of the world through, through modern transportation mechanisms. So all of these, you know, the periods have been ones where, of complex system cycles where the system builds up, it gets disrupted, it collapses, and it, and it has to reform itself but also all under in the context of gradually increasing globalization, but with these clearly demarked events uh, bookending each of the major epochs. And we might be in another one now with the connection of the fiber optic cable, which was just made. And so now we have, we're for the first time fully digitally connected uh, to the rest of the world and we're sort of living out what the consequences of that would be for, for good and, and for ill, not necessarily bad. <coughs> Another thing about our context that's interesting is we're at the end of a biodiversity gradient, a natural biodiversity gradient. So the Tedium Morea here, French Polynesia. This is the number of coral genera you find. Uh, we're at relatively low diversity, and this applies to fish, it applies to plants, it applies to insects, it's pretty general. It even applies to languages and human culture. You know, the Polynesians is one culture, one language. If you go to Papua New Guinea, you end up there's 900 or so different languages. So there's much more diversity uh, in the west than there is out, out here in the east. And this is a natural phenomenon. So if something like Fiji is sort of intermediate in terms of its biodiversity. And again, that can be good or bad. I mean, the system here functions well, so we have enough biodiversity, it seems, to survive pretty comfortably. And in some cases in the west, where there's more biodiversity, it's not necessarily a good thing. You have malaria out there because you have some species out there we don't have here, thankfully. So you know, what is the role of biodiversity in ecosystem function and human well-being, you know, some, some of it's good, some of it's maybe not so good. So as a scientific, again, natural laboratory, this is a great place for us to work. 
So just coming back to this vision of, of the blue planet and where we are. <coughs> the blue planet's clearly alive. If you took away all the water, you'd have a brown planet and it would be pretty dead. Well, certainly if, it, if we took all the water away, there wouldn't be life on Earth, at least not life that we, as we know it. Well, in this image, they took all of that water and condensed it into a ball, into a balloon here, to see how big it would be. And see, it's a pretty small sphere, so it looks like we're a blue planet, but if you took all the water on Earth and put it into a ball, it would look like that. So very small compared to, to the Earth. Even more shocking is if you looked at only the fresh water, it would be a, a, a tiny little ball. And you can probably barely even see it, but if you look at just lakes and rivers, which is where most of our drinking water and accessible water comes from, it, it's really a minuscule amount. So these kinds of images just make you realize how precious some of these resources are, how they're certainly finite. You know, there may be enough of them, maybe that's enough, but of course it depends on how many of us there are and how we use those resources. But they're not infinite in any sense, and they may even be very limiting. <coughs> of course this matters today, it didn't really matter so much in the past, but it matters when we get 7 billion people going up to maybe 10 billion at some point, but we're having these huge impacts on the planet. We can no longer ignore or think that our resources are inexhaustible. We have to start to manage them. <coughs> and we see that our impacts, obviously there's some big local ones. If you're in New York City, it's pretty obvious there's local impacts. But there's the, these impacts are happening everywhere in the world and they're, they're truly global. And we know that partly because if you see these impacts, even in the remotest places like these islands, you know what's happening is not just uh, happening in Europe or the United States or China or somewhere, it's, it's really, its effects are being felt everywhere. And so these are the, the classic observations of carbon dioxide concentration on, from Mauna Loa on Hawaii, uh, which really raised the alert to climate change. And here, you know, here's Captain Cook <laughs> right down there, and then everything hit the fan afterwards. So that something kind of remarkable happened in the 1770s, somewhere around here, that you know, the world population goes up, uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, spike. But again, the point is that we can see these effects in the middle of the Pacific, which shows that they're truly a, a global impact. And if we look you know, at all kinds of things that matter to society, they're affected by these changes, whether they're things we do locally or, or the things we do locally, which have impacts uh, elsewhere, or what other people are doing that are going to impact us here. So again, even in remote islands, all of these things, uh, like agriculture and fisheries, or what we depend upon, our culture, is affected by these changes. And we need to understand that and adapt to them. So what this means is with all these, the fact that we are engineering the Earth, whether we like it or not, we're doing it already. You will talk about terraforming or geoengineering is, well, we are geoengineering the Earth. <laughs> so the question is, are we doing it the right way? Um, and what can we do about it to, to be a little more sensitive. And so for science, this is really the greatest challenge for our century, is how can we develop a science of sustainability? Because these are facts, these are things we can observe, we can model, we can understand the processes, and then, then how, how we can act upon those to ensure that we're still here in the future and uh, prospering in the future. So sustainability science is a, is a new kind of science, and the approach we're trying to develop partly here and with colleagues around the world, is, is one that based on starting at the genome, at the molecular level, it has to be processes that are happening at that scale, right up to processes that are happening on a planetary scale. And we need to be able to integrate across all of those enormous <laughs> range in, in time and space. So what happens inside your cells or inside the cells of, of, a, of a coral polyp out there matter. We need to understand that to see whether there'll be a reef here in 10, 15, 20 years. But we also need to understand at the level of the planet what's happening with the climate, the level of uh, carbon that's going into the ocean that's affecting acidification. But we might know how acidic the ocean's getting, but unless we know how, at the cellular level, organisms are able to respond to that, we're not going to be able to say what the consequences will be. So this is uh, the roadmap from systems biology, which is, is how we've had some really remarkable success in understanding how cells work in cell and molecular biology and 
how organisms function. <coughs> and what we're trying to do is combine that work from the genome up to, through the cell to the organism with work that's happening through satellites and, and remote sensing and a lot of global studies look, looking at the whole planet. And how, how can we bring those together? And there's global institutions, intergovernmental organizations that are coordinating Earth observations, whether biological, social, uh, physical. And then there's other organizations who work at the genomic level who are coordinating here too. And we need to integrate up. You know, but you're, the, the challenge is working across vast different spatial scales. And of course, very many different scientific domains that aren't historically used to talking to each other. So um, these predictive models need big data. They need lots of data to feed into the models. Uh, and obviously, have a big island to uh, generate data from. Uh, we're obviously working at national scales as well. But those are still pretty substantial scales. In the United States, you have a, a new program called the NEON, the National Ecological Observatory Network, which is trying to do this basically across the whole of the continental United States and, and Hawaii and Alaska. <coughs> and then we have little, little islands, which is still a big challenge for us to document, understand, but obviously it's in some ways a lot more tractable than it is for those larger places. Because as we know, again, from bio biomedical research, we can make a lot of progress if we focus our energy on a few model systems and, and small model systems that are particularly tractable. So the model system approach has been incredibly powerful in, in biomedical research. And it's focused on a few species, like the fruit fly, C. elegans, not particularly because we care that much about those species, necessarily. But because they're small, not that complicated, we can make big strides in understanding how they function. And because we're all connected in the tree of life, some of the molecular processes, cellular processes happening in C. elegans happen in our bodies too. So we can learn a lot about humans by studying these relatively simple systems. So what we're trying to do here is, is making the case for we need to do the same thing to understand social ecological systems. We need a few social ecological systems that we focus on and really get to understand. And being in this gradient here, you know, we're a relatively simple one. We're like the fruit fly. You know, here you'd have mouse and, and over here somewhere you've got human. These are the really complex places. So we're trying to build up from something relatively simple, uh, learn lessons that can be applied in more and more complex places. So Maria's a good place for that. You know, and another reason for focusing at, at this scale, this sort of spatial scale of a small island, it's not, an island's nice because it's, it's clear cut. We can measure the inputs and outputs very easily. But really, a, a lot of, you know, the point of having this predictive power, these mechanistic understandings of systems, is that we can do something about it, so we can act. But we act through our governments and, and through our communities. You know, the global scale, we have fairly limited capacity to act. Global governance is pretty limited. Um, it's important, but it's, it's, it's difficult. At the national scale, we, we have much more capacity to make, take actions once we have knowledge. Even there, it's difficult. But really, a lot of most of the impacts and a lot of the decisions are made in day-to-day -day life at the municipal and the local level. So the impacts, you feel what happens to you here. That's why people say all politics is local. Right? It's, you might care a little bit what's happening on the other side of the world, but you really care about what's happening in, in your neighborhood. So it's really important to work with community and uh, our model is this, is, this is our globe, this is the planet, and we try and understand everything up to, the, to that planet. Recognizing the Barrera itself is influenced by everything that's happening around it too. But that, that's our system. The system is clearly defined. We want to understand all the parts within the system, how they function, how they interact, and then try and predict how that system will function under when it's buffeted by different kinds of inputs from outside. Where all these parts come from matters too, because parts in a living system have history and they behave differently depending on their history. So also a lot of research in understanding where Polynesians came from, we can use archaeological research, uh, where all the species came from, we can use phylogenetic analyses, what was the historic climate here in Moray, the geological history and so forth. And then adding on top of that, how's the things changing today? So things that we can observe now. And again, this we've become a test bed for a lot of new technologies, so sensor networks, robots, drones, where we can collect data in, in almost in real time and stream it from the island to understand how systems are changing today. 
And that includes or building on those physical observations or observations of ecosystem processes. So fish and plants and birds and microbes. And as I say, now we have this, this capacity to observe at the molecular scale too. So as well as the more traditional ecological sort of observations, we need to add this new layer where we're observing changes at the molecular scale. Um, and really our, our challenge is where do we apply the lens? You know, we have these tools, we have the telescopes to see these things and they're, they're getting cheaper and cheaper, but they're still not free and we still have to say where, where, do, we, where do we direct them to learn the most? And for that you need a lot of sci expert scientific knowledge to understand. <coughs> the final part of the observatory is you have to observe socioeconomy, you know, hu humans and the things we do, uh, the transport systems, the buildings, the uh, energy use. So there's unemployment uh, statistics, all of, the, all of the kinds of data we have which pertain to our well-being, some level health, health statistics. So, so it's obviously a vast amount of study in a lot of different, very specialized scientific disciplines. Lots of data and lots of really exciting new ways to capture and acquire data. And some computational tools that enable us to actually use those data intelligently and, and learn about the functions of the system. But the challenge is how to integrate all of those. That's the fundamental challenge in sustainability. We know a lot about all the component parts. How do we bring it all together to understand a whole functioning system. I know that's something that you guys spend a lot of time working on in, in complex dynamical systems and, and this you know this is the challenge for Morea and it's ultimately the challenge for the for the whole planet. So we have we have this uh, initiative which we call the Avatar, which is to you know the Morea Island Digital Ecosystem Avatar, which is to build a computational model of the island. And on that model we can run different scenarios, predictive scenarios under different circumstances what will happen you know if in scenarios of ocean acidification or rising sea levels or different policies that might be applied you know can we see well, it's not going to be able to predict anything precisely but can we see what the relative trade-offs and risks might be uh, to interrogate across all of those scientific domains across all of those spatial scales to get back a, a, an answer we can actually act upon so it's really a, the aim, the ultimate aim is to be a very a management tool so policy, public policy decisions can, can lean on this to make better decisions. And some of the things that we'll have to observe in the sustainability observatory, for example, you know, the flows, the flows through the system, the flows of water, you know, we can see it. It lands up there in precipitation rain, it goes down through the valleys, ends up in the lagoon, and it flows around the lagoon. You know, and the oceanographers study all the circulation patterns in the lagoon and can predict them to relatively high resolution in some cases. But if we want to follow water through the whole system, you know, we, we can do that. Uh, and as water flows through, how is it picking up nutrients? How, is it how does it influence uh, erosion and runoff? Uh, what plants can grow? Um, energy flow through the system. This obviously energy flows through uh, food webs, so that's part of it. How does it flow through the natural system? And we're part of the food web eating things in agriculture. But one of the, these connectivity issues that we transformed is now we bring in most of the energy from outside in oil. So oil is a tiny amount of energy, probably uh, compared to the solar energy that hits Morea, but the accessibility of oil as an energy and what we could do with it transformed this island ecosystem. It had a huge impact, that, that one energy flow. Uh, genes, interaction of genes, uh, across the system, macronutrients, information, culture, and money. Money is a measure of value, economic value. Um, these are all things we need to track. So we had a first workshop to try and bring together some of the people working in, you know, here are all the scales we try and work across, try and identify who works where, in what, what are these boxes, you know, these are all specialist scientific fields. And the, re the real key was trying to understand how can we start to build an approach where we can share across those fields, not just data, but knowledge. And to be able to interrogate that expertise so machines can do it. So the kinds of practical, just to finish, the kind of practical examples is, you know, we had a, a study a few years ago which modeled the build out of Morea under current zoning regulations and rates of population growth, okay? So it's sort of a business as usual. You know, if you don't change your zoning regulations, if 
the island continues to grow, population grows through immigration and natural growth rate. In less than 50 years' time, you'll end up with this amount of uh, buildings covering the island, and the density of people will be like downtown Papiete. You know, so again, this is just one si relatively simple model. Uh, you know, you show the, that to the mayor of Morea, and so, whoa, uh, we don't necessarily want that, but that's, that's another decision. Do you want to be like downtown Papiete? Maybe, maybe some people do. But certainly it'll have, a, it'll have consequences. So if we're on that trajectory, and business as usual under scenario one, now then of course we add layers. If we have the capacity, we add layers. The layers might be, okay, that's under scenario one, under climate change scenario one. You know, what if about under another scenario of climate change, how would that change this output? And then under those, how, how would this change uh, the reef? Again, business as usual, if you have the same kind of septic systems, et cetera, et cetera, the roofs are tin, the runoff, that's going to do something for erosion rates from what we know from the coral reef ecologists. If you've got that much more sediment coming in, it flips the system to algae after the next crown of thorns outbreak. You know, you'll be fine for 15 years, you'll think everything's great, and then you'll have a crown of thorns or you'll have a cyclone, and you've lost the resilience of the system because of this slight increase, maybe slight increase in runoff, and now you've got an algal reef. And that will do something to your tourism, and you know, that'll have all kinds of impacts on, on the society's health and everything else. <coughs> so clearly just start, you know, just running through that example, that's just a massively complex, you're not going to get a, a, a right or wrong answer. You're just going to say that if you go in this trajectory, you're likely to end up with an algal reef, you're likely to end up with poverty because there won't be any tourists, for example. So it increases the risks of those sorts of things happening. And here are a few things you could do, like you know, better septic systems or whatever, which would reduce some of the negative consequences of that. So that's sort of the goal. And of course, you want to be able to do that for every community in the world. So partly it's building a platform that enables us to do that, at least in one place, and then say how much of that can then be translated to other, other communities. So that's the end. Uh, it's just our attempt to build the matrix here on, on Morea. So thank you.